I'm Mia Michelle Sandor, White House correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Welcome to Race in Oklahoma, a special presentation by OETA. The death of George Floyd at the hands of police set off protests across the country and in cities in Oklahoma. We're now in a national reckoning on race. For some, conversations about systemic racism and policing are new. But for many African Americans, George Floyd's death brought to the forefront issues people deal with every day. To understand more about how he got here, we'll explore some of America's flawed and often violent history. In Oklahoma, it's been 99 years since one of the deadliest acts of racial violence in U.S. history took place. The Tulsa Race Massacre got renewed national attention when President Trump announced plans to visit the state this week. Let's talk about all of this with Oklahoma State Representative Regina Goodwin. She's chair of the Oklahoma Legislative Black Caucus. Deborah Hunter, she's a poet, artist, and activist in Tulsa. Her grandparents are also survivors of the Tulsa massacre. And J.B. Williams, he's an Emmy award-winning rapper and activist in Oklahoma City. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. I wanna start with you, Representative Goodwin. What do you make of the president coming to your state amid the uptick of COVID-19 cases and of course, in the midst of all this conversation and a national reckoning on race? Well, uh, first of all, the numbers are rising in uh, Oklahoma. This had been predicted. Uh, Governor Stitt opened the state too soon. Uh, so this rise in COVID-19, the virus of it, uh, having to sign a waiver just to go into uh, a rally with the president, all of it doesn't make much sense. And for all those that choose not to wear a mask or choose to gather in the, so they say hundreds of thousands, again, while they might not want to sign a waiver, we're concerned about the other residents here in Oklahoma who wish to remain safe, who wish to stem the tide of COVID-19. So I don't think it's very wise and our health department officials have said the same, but um, we're going to continue to press on and do what we have to do here in Oklahoma in a sensible fashion as best as we can. And sticking with you, Representative, what do you want him to know about Tulsa as President Trump um, comes to your state? Well, what, we would hope that with all of this advance, uh, Fuhrer, that uh, the president would be well informed. So we're hoping he doesn't have to learn much about Tulsa, Oklahoma. If he does have to learn much about Tulsa, Oklahoma, that says something about his staff, maybe, perhaps. And it would then again point to our president. Uh, I would hope that he would be concerned enough to know before he would come into the city. Deborah, some 300 people died during the Tulsa race massacre. Uh, hundreds of homes were destroyed. Your grandparents experienced that. What did they tell you about that? And talk to me about the lasting trauma that maybe has happened in your own family. Yeah. Well, the trauma was, was so um, deep uh, among my family that no one talked about it. Um, I was 20 years old before I even knew that 1921 Greenwood happened. There was a magazine called Impact Magazine that uh, was local. And um, I saw the magazine and I was stunned. I had never heard the stories before. And when I tried to talk to my surviving grandmother, there was only one, only had one grandparent still alive at that time. And she was still so traumatized. Um, that this was on the 50th anniversary in 1971. And she was still so traumatized that she refused to talk about it. She admitted that she was here during that time, that she had been one of the individuals who had been detained and um, was uh, released only after the white woman she worked for vouched for her. And she said she wasn't gonna say anything else. So I know the trauma was, was deep with her and within the family because I, haven't been able to get family stories from any other members of my family. With that in mind, what do you make of the president coming to the state, um, especially as you think about the police violence that is in some ways dovetailed and connected to the history of racial violence that African-Americans have faced here? I think it's careless and irresponsible. Um, I think, um, First of all, um, we know the kind of audiences that he attracts. We know the, um, what happens in his rallies. Is, uh, so this is something that is careless coming here at this particular time when we have uh, so much going on in this country and, 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 and so much being exposed about what we've always known 
to happen with uh, African Americans and police. The fact that this is Juneteenth celebration, even if he moved it to another day, it, that's irrelevant. And uh, here we are leading into the centennial of the Greenwood 1921 massacre. Um, it feels intentional. JB, Deborah just said this feels intentional, the president coming um, as African-Americans and Americans on a whole. Think about Juneteenth and the, the, the holiday that is celebrating African-Americans getting the word that they are free. What do you make of what you've been hearing um, as you think about this moment that we're living through and, and the president coming to your state? I think what they just said is pretty much how we all feel, you know, regardless of the, of the change of date. For anybody, any, any of us who, who celebrated, uh, who celebrate Juneteenth, um, we've always celebrated Juneteenth the entire weekend. So whether you, whether you come on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, like that, that weekend still um, is to commemorate and honor, um, uh, you know, Juneteenth. So the change of the day is, is irrelevant to me. I think that uh, the mission is still the same. The mission is, is still uh, white supremacy. I think that, um, you know, in, in light of uh, where our country is, in light of the climate that we're in in Oklahoma, um, you know, I think that he's going out of his way to, to, uh, to disregard that. I think he's going out, going out of his way to really just, you know, um, rally his troops and declare war on a race of people and a group of people. I say that because whenever, like she said before, whenever he has his rallies, whenever he, 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 um, people gather for him, you know, those are the, the type of people and the type of things that follow. White supremacy follows him, um, you know, racism follows him, the, the KKK follow him. So what, if, if you know that, which I'm sure he does, um, you know, to know all those things and to plan a rally in a place like Tulsa on a day and a weekend like Juneteenth, you're going out of your way to inflict, um, uh, inflict harassment on a group of people you're going out of your way to declare war on a group of people because you know whenever you show up what you bring and as you think about that you, you say you feel like the president's declaring war on african americans in oklahoma there's also this idea that this is part of a long history of racial violence that started really from the beginning of when african americans were kidnapped and forcibly brought to the united states when you think about the history of the united states but also particularly the history of oklahoma how do you think that dovetails and connects with your own activism and black lives matter now uh, i think for me it just it just really um kind of, you know, opens my eyes to um, to where we are compared to where I thought we might have been, you know, um, we've, we, you know, we always, we always talk about the progress we've made, but I feel like, um, you know, we're, we're getting to a point of regression where we're, we're, we're going back, you know, when we think about Juneteenth, the, the, like she said, you know, those are the things in history that we never were, were taught. And the only things that we were taught in history about our, our past is that we were slaves and we were taught that all these people who enslaved us were heroes. So if you tell a, 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 a race of people their entire life that, um, that you know, all you've ever been in, in history was a slave and that these other people who enslaved you were the heroes, um, you're writing their story for them. You know? And I think that all of that uh, is on purpose. And I think that today we're getting to the point to where we want to write and illustrate and author our own stories for our own people. Representative Goodwin, JB said something that was interesting, which is that he thinks in some ways that the progress that Americans, especially and him in, in particular, thought we made, maybe we're not there yet. Do you have that same feeling? And as you think about that question, talk about the fact that you feel like there are people that are being over-policed and what are the solutions that you see um, there that could happen um, to, to change that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, the progress that we have made in the past um, as it relates to race relations, as it relates to um, being treated better in America, we're losing ground. We talk about uh, the knee on the neck, 
of George Floyd, where we watched a man murdered on screen. Well, we have a video of Derek Scott in Oklahoma City, a police officer's knees on his neck, died in the exact same fashion, and he was saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So we have these stories all through the nation, and we're saying as it relates to policing, we as legislators, just this session, I had introduced the legislation as it dealt with excessive force. It dealt with the language is, is it reasonable or is it necessary? That bill did not get a hearing. It was in that same bill that we talked about an officer should not be able to use the excuse of, I feared for my life, so I'm going to take yours. Again, mm -hmm. no hearing in the Oklahoma State Legislature. This session had a bill as it related to hate crimes, which said a hate crime in Oklahoma should be a felony. Did not get a hearing. Had a bill as it related to body cams, saying body cams should be mandated. You should have to have your body cam on, and if you don't have it on, that should become a misdemeanor because that's the equivalent of tampering with evidence. Did not receive a hearing in the Oklahoma State Legislature. And Deborah, do you think that policy, even if maybe legislators are able to get those things through, that that's going to be enough to change the, the knees on the necks of African Americans across this country, as some believe um, this is playing out? I think it's a start. Um, but um, as we, we've always heard, you know, you can't legislate a person's heart. And so uh, I think that it's important. It is so important that our, we vote people in who uh, can start making those changes. I also think that um, education is, in, is just so important because there are generations of us who, who did learn some things you know, uh, about our history. We may not have known about what happened locally, but we had history. Our teachers told us things that were not in the history books so that my generation knew that we weren't always slaves. Um, so we have um, a lack of education. So I think, it's, I think legislation is a, a huge part of it. Uh, what's been happening lately is, you know, I, we have white people who are being educated for the very first time about what racism is and understanding their, their position of privilege. Um, I think that that's, that's kind of a, a new wave uh, because we've always been in the position of having white people who are put themselves as the, you know, the great white savior or the, uh, the hero in our stories. And um, so I think by us taking the reins and, and, and making it important for us to tell our stories, as JD was saying, you know, we need to tell our stories. We need to, uh, uh, no, but it's hard to, we also need to have our, the education to know what the stories are so that we can tell them in, in our way and, um, and, and tell the truth, balance things out. I think it's really important for us to, um, to know what we're talking about. Well, lots to talk about. Thank you so much for sharing this time, Representative Goodwin, Deborah Hunter, and J.B. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. The injustices faced by African Americans touch almost every part of life, including healthcare, education, and policing. To talk about all of that, I'm joined by Dr. Donnie Nero, a retired teacher and president of Connor State College. He was the first African American president of a non historically Black institution in Oklahoma. I'm also joined by Bethany Jay, a reporter with the Black Chronicle newspaper, and Laron Chapman, a filmmaker whose di directorial debut, You People, explores issues of race and identity. Thanks so much, all of you, for being here. Laron, I want to start with you. Um, this moment for a lot of people has just been overwhelming. You think of the pandemic, you think of the protest, you think of the national conversation on policing. What do you make of all of this? I think what we're seeing is years and years of injustices being um, manifested from years of silenced voices. You know, I think, I think when we see these protests, you know, it's definitely, I mean, while there's rage, there's anger, there's, there's, there's so much just um, unspoken and that needs to be heard. And I, I'm glad people are listening. I think the pandemic has just added, you know, insult to injury you know, as we're already 
at disenfranchised groups, ethnic minorities. Um, and so I think people are, are, are wanting people to listen. Dr. Nero, I wanna to come to you. What do you think this pandemic in this moment has revealed when you think of inequalities faced in Oklahoma? Yeah, I'm 71 years old. I'm from the old school and I have seen quite a bit. I grew up and was raised in a black community. I went to a segregated black school where we had black teachers during a time when the community and the church and the family were very uh, uh, integral in the parts and in, in the facts of the, the, the lives of African-Americans. So I've seen quite a bit during the sit-ins with Claire Looper in Oklahoma City, uh, who was my teacher as well. Uh, I think this time is a, a very important time for, for all of us, but we must uh, uh, capture the energy that we have through this uh, movement and this energy must not, um, we must have a plan. There must be a plan in place. And I know there are a lot of concerns, but being in education so many years, uh, we didn't move forward without a plan. So a plan must uh, be implemented in the, each of these communities to make a change because we can go through this process and we can go through it uh, from time to time and then at the end of the process, when we look back and if there's nothing been implemented, it's been all for naught. So we must take advantage of the plan. The older generation must work with the younger generation to be able to capture the energy that these young people have and to be able to move forward and make this, uh, this America and this great state of Oklahoma better. Dr. Nero, you talk about needing a plan. Um, you, are, you are someone who has dedicated your life to education. Part of the plan for African-Americans that I heard in my household, but also that I heard in my reporting was get an education, be twice as good. That will ensure you some of the promises of America. But have you, how, how have you, what do you make of that concept now as we've seen what's played out? And what do you make of the injustices and inequalities that you see in Oklahoma schools? I think the plan, the, the education is very important. That's the basis or the foundation. So many times we have been denied because people say, have said to us, if you only had an education, if you only had this degree. So we have moved forward and we have obtained those degrees, but there is still systemic racism within the, the systems that uh, we're trying to enter within the medical field, within the schools, within the city governments. And so the, the education is part of it, but the, we must uh, use and have more than education to be able to break down these walls. You know, we, we have to challenge the people who are in these positions or in the positions of leadership and leadership of power. I'm not saying challenge their race. I'm not saying challenge their integrity. I'm not ch saying challenge them, but we need to challenge them that they need to do unto others and do good unto all mankind. And then once we do that, we, we get them to see that uh, we're all human. We're all in it together and education can make a difference. But if we go into it without that education, it's gonna be used against us for, for uh, uh, years and years. Bethany, Dr. Nero is saying that education is the key. You grew up at one point as being one of only two black students um, in your school and your father often told you to be twice as good at talking about education. What do you make of that concept and what you're hearing from Dr. Nero? I think he's exactly right. Um, you know, my mother is a principal as well uh, and they were both strong supporters uh, who preach the importance of education and the power of education. Uh, but when you're looking at statistics and you're seeing where a white male with a high school diploma might be making more or be able to find employment quicker than a black man or a black woman with a college degree. Uh, those types of things are discouraging when you're constantly told you have to get your education, get your education. And so you go and you get your bachelor's and then you maybe even go and get a master's, a PhD, um, but you're still facing those issues because of that systemic racism. It can be like, you, you just feel like, what else can I do? What else do I do? Um, I tried to play it by the rules. I tried to do exactly what they said. I got all A's. I went and got scholarships. I did internships. I did everything. Um, but yet I'm still facing so many hurdles to just try to make a way for my family um, to progress. 
And Laron, what Bethany's talking about is really how systemic racism plays out. It, it, African Americans and other and people of color, they get all the degrees, they get all of the things that they think maybe it makes the, it makes their dreams possible, and then systemic racism kind of hits them in the face. When you think about the fact that you yourself have been racially profiled, tell me a little bit about your experiences, and tell me a little bit about what you make make of the language that we use when we think about just the word racist. Absolutely, I think. Um... I think we think when we get an education or you follow all those instructions, as they say, you know, that you're somehow going to avoid racism or somehow being more well-spoken or having an education is going to escape, you're going to escape these issues, but it, it doesn't happen. And I think because what's happening now is everything is more nuanced. It's harder to, it's harder to identify. As you mentioned, you say the, the term racist and then immediately people get up in arms and have a very... Um, extreme idea of what that is, but it exists in even more subtle ways than that, you know, as we understand with microaggressions, um, how we communicate with people of color, how we um, approach them. Um, I, I can't tell you how often I'm told that because I speak the way that I do, that I'm now more white or more, you know, in that space. And I feel like those kinds of things um, are all kind of wrapped up with representation, how people view them in the media. I want to stick with you, Laron, and talk about the idea of um, white people and um, the perceptions of intersectionality. A lot of your work deals with intersectionality, your, your film, you people. How do you see your work as, as bringing education or as doing the work to try to explain to people how all of the different identities of people come together? Absolutely. How we are represented matters. So if all we see are negative representations of, of ourselves, um, it, it gives people a negative perception of what we are. And it, it, it kind of invites that fear. It kind of invite, and it kind of makes us have, you know, a certain lower self-esteem in that way. So but much, much of my work has been geared towards, you know, kind of dispelling myths about these stereotypes, not putting people in boxes, showing everyone in a three-dimensional way, um, which is what I did with my film, You People. And Bethany, I've heard from a lot of people um, that they are, especially a lot of African-American people, that their white friends are texting saying, what can we do to help? How can we kind of be an ally? Some people feel that that's a burden. Some people feel like, okay, these people are coming from a good place. What do you make and what of your responsibility to try to explain to white folks what they should be doing in this moment? You know, on one end, I'm, I, I'm excited and I'm happy that these questions and these conversations are being had. Um, on the other end, I think what we're facing as African Americans, kind of two pandemics, if you will, um, with COVID and with what's happening with the racial tension, we're dealing with a lot uh, in our mental health, our emotional health. And I've, I've had friends uh, who are white who have taught themselves different languages, who have taught themselves um, how to gain certain skills. And so I just feel like you've got to take the steps. Google is an awesome tool <laughs> to use uh, to keep yourself informed. Um, sometimes that creates a lot of pressure. And, you know, growing up in predominantly white spaces, I kind of felt that pressure. I think that a lot of African Americans do where you feel that you're the representative for your entire race. Um, that's a lot to take on and to feel like it's now my job to inform everyone and tell them how they should behave or what are microaggressions or what are things that are just unacceptable? Um, that's a lot of pressure. So I feel like we, I'm, I'm excited, like I said, that those conversations are being had, but I do feel that they kind of need to make those first steps, pick up a book. Like I said, Google is an awesome tool, YouTube, um, podcast, there's, there's a, nut, a ton of sources that are available to you if you truly do want to know how you can do more and how you can do better. And as Bethany says, pick up a book, I have to go back to you, Dr. Nero. You are someone who's lived a long life in Oklahoma and in other parts of the country. Um, Oklahoma is the is really the buckle of the Bible Belt, but we've seen protests there in a, in a red state, a deeply red state. Do you think that this is a tipping point? Do you think that this is the time where we might see some sort of structural change given all that you've experienced and studied yourself? I sure hope so. And I, I believe it can be and, and it will be, but we must, once all the excitement and all the protests are over, uh, while the iron is hot, if you will, we need to strike and we need to pull our leaders together because within these systems, uh, when uh, you, you look at these systems, we have to change. And I'll give you a good example. You know, being the president of a college, 
within that institution, you had the financial aid department, you had the scholarship department, you had all those different uh, departments, history or whatever. Within those departments, that's where change needs to occur. It needs to occur because why are not the black, why the black students are not receiving scholarships? Why are they not receiving financial aid? Why do we not have more black professors? So those were some things that we tried to address within the institution. And each government or institution or entity have, has to do a self-examination, has to be able to evaluate what they're doing and why they're doing it. Another point is when we get to a point as black Americans, we get to a point sometimes we forget about our brothers and sisters who are continuing the struggle. I think we need to help and do all we can to support our brothers and sisters who are struggling during this time. Uh, we, we tend to sometimes get there and say, I've made it and you can make it too. Well, I wouldn't have made it if it hadn't been for Claire Looper, if it hadn't been for different people who supported me, who brought me along the way. So we need to remember that as well, but we need to harness this energy that we have right now. And it all goes back to having a systematic plan, a SWOT analysis or whatever you want to call it, but we need to have a plan in each of these entities to be able to address the problems and then move forward with what we had put on paper. Well, it's certainly a lot to process. Thank you so much for joining me, Laron, Bethany, Dr. Nero. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for watching this special program, Race in Oklahoma on OETA. Hopefully the conversation we started tonight will continue across the state and the nation. You can find more resources online at OETA.tv. I'm Yamisha Sandor with the PBS NewsHour. Good night.